All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Authors Unite show. Today, I have Mark Shaken with us. He is the author of And Just Like That, Essays on a Life Before, During, and After the Law, Tracing His Path Into and Out of His Law Career. So welcome to the show, man. Good to be here. I'm excited to talk to you, Tyler. Grateful to have you on. Um, I'm excited to talk to you, too. So I always like to start off the interview like this. So it, it, when you were younger, did you think that you would be a lawyer? Oh, or... heavens, heavens no. Okay. <laughs> the, the best answer I could give, no. You know, um, and younger would go through college. I never thought that being a lawyer, sitting behind a desk, wearing a tie, working in a large law firm was in, in my destiny whatsoever. Um, mm. Not at all. Um, I went to law school, um, because I couldn't figure out what else to do after having some um, uh, different ex exploratory uh, ideas of things to try after college and during college, such as driving a forklift and yeah. um, painting lines on the highway and the state highways in Connecticut. You can find my lines. They're not the straight ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and eliminating things that I really just wasn't very good at. And I, I went to law school to give me three more years to try to figure out what to do with my life. Mm -hmm. um, but even as I was um, in law school or taking the bar exam or starting my first law job, I, uh, or for the 38 years I was a lawyer, I just never got around to thinking that being a lawyer was my destiny, which is mm -hmm. unusual, I suppose, having done it for so long, you know, 41 years, including law school. Yeah, well, I mean, the pay is good, right? Is that, is that kind of, is that maybe a little bit of the trap in a sense, right? It's like the lawyer, doctor, like some people love it, right? But like, it's more of you know, you, it's kind of the thing you would do to make your parents proud in a sense. Yeah. Right. Um, I wasn't as focused on making them proud, although they yeah. were, they were, um, uh, and the pay. And so that's interesting. When I got out of, of course, for the three years in law school, you're, you're it's a reverse payment. <laughs> you're in debt. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there's, there's really no, there's no, really no economic upside for the first three years. And for me, I, um, got into the bankruptcy business accidentally, I um, started to look for a law job in my third year. And one of the bankruptcy judges uh, in, in where I was going to law school posted, this was before the electronic era, so he posted a three by five card that he was looking for a law clerk. Um, mm. And uh, I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll go interview with him. I loved him. He, he tolerated or liked me. <laughs> and and um, he hired me, but that was a terrible paying job. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you can extend the, the, the no pay for another three years. Um, uh, and I, I guess at some point, um, the pay was good, but um, yeah. it, it took a while. Uh, and I, I just never honestly seemed to be all that focused on the pay. Yeah. Um, um, maybe it's easier to not be focused on the pay when you're making a comfortable wage. I, I, I'd certainly concede that, but yeah. you know, for me, it was, you know, is this, do I have a passion to do this? Um, because, um, you know, I read some of your interviews and you, you, you found your passion quick. Yeah. I, I, um, went to law school for three years to try to help find my passion and it took 38 more years before I did it. So I stumbled around a lot more than, than you did, but Steve Jobs has this, you know, famous quote about if if you don't have the passion, it, it in my words, it ain't gonna work. Yeah. And, and and I learned that, and that's true. If I had the passion uh, to be in a large law firm, um, it, it dulled over time. Gotcha. Over time. So, what do you, family, kids? Is that was that kind of maybe like what kept you in it, or? Um. So there's there's um. A, a number of things. Um, certainly family is extremely important to me. We have one kid, but um, uh, very important. Um, um, but my other passions <clears throat> really had nothing to do with being a lawyer, which I, I came to believe was a really good thing. Yeah. Um, at least for me, you know, being a lawyer um, <clears throat> wasn't um, something I wanted to do 24 seven. I had to have a break at some point and find something that I could call the balance. Yeah, the other stuff, and for me, it, it was music and photography. Um, okay, and, and gotcha. still, still is now. You know, the, the joke about a professional photographer is it's uh, the difference between a photographer <clears throat> and a pizza is a pizza feeds a family of three. <laughs> and, and a, a photographer may not be able to do that, especially <laughs> in, in the modern era when everybody has a camera in their phone. Um, yeah, <clears throat> but um, 
at some point, um, as I sort of thought and dreamed and negotiated with myself about how much longer I was going to stay at the big firms, um, at some point, I, I guess I started to realize that what was important to me was to find something that I come home at night and I say, you know, I'm measuring myself and my life by what I gave as opposed mm -hmm. to what I got. So to your question about the pay is good, the pay yeah. is good, but you tend to start to measure your, your existence by what you're getting. And, yeah. um, and for me, that wasn't sustainable. Um, and yeah. It is for some, and the book isn't critical of those that find the passion in the, in the law. Uh, um, but what's interesting about lawyers is that um, there's a whole bunch of lawyers that sort of don't glide gracefully into the career. They come to it as yeah. uh, as a answer to the question, well, what else can I do? Um, yeah. And um, the, the I think the, the book, as I was writing it and people heard that I was writing it, and you know, based on the reviews that it's been getting, um, has, you know, strikes a chord. There's a whole bunch of lawyers that, that have this thing inside of them that said, you know, how did this happen? How did I, how did I get to be a lawyer? Yeah. Uh, and is this really what it's all about? Yeah, I would find it, at least for me, and you've listened to a few episodes, so you know, like, I'm like a people person, so I can do this all day. But when I, um, like, when we're negotiating, let's say, contracts with a potential client, like my favorite is always actually when a lawyer is not involved because <laughs> it's so uh, like our agreements are very basic. That's basically just like, depending on what service they were to do with us, we would be like, we'll, you know, help you get this result. If we don't do that, we'll give you a refund. That's like very basic, <laughs> but like when a lawyer gets into it, we like, we, I've had occasions where it'll come back and now it's like 12 pages long. And I'm like, and I don't understand what it says. I call it lawyer language. Cause I, I don't, I truly am reading it. And I'm like, I'm not quite sure what I'm signing. So I don't know. I'm wondering, is there a way, is there like a, is there a middle path to this that the layman can understand what you guys are actually saying? In the <laughs> <laughs> There's probably translation dictionaries around that they <laughs> try to explain and, and, and certainly the commercial bankruptcy world can drive people crazy because yeah. it's got its entire uh, whole language. But you know, there are you know, straightforward, simple contracts that are appropriate. I know yeah. when, I, when I was writing the book, I was trying to figure out, do I want to find a publishing company? Do I want to self-publish? Yeah. And I, I found uh, a couple of publishing companies that um, might be interested. And so I said, send me the contract. And that's not a short, simple contract. Yeah. And, and I, I called back and I said, wow, this is pretty intense. Um, are you open to comments? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and they said, yes. And so I gave some comments and, and there was one of them that I think I gave, you know, five comments and they accepted exactly zero of the five. <laughs> <laughs> including typos <laughs> and, and i and i called back and i said well if you weren't going to accept any why didn't you tell me to, to do this <laughs> um yeah. and, and some of that drove me to self-publish it's just it's more fun it's it's an educational process to say the For least sure. um, yeah because yeah. I, yeah. I get it i mean i guess it's like there's protections the way that i kind of see things now and then obviously we'll get back to the book we're just talking lawyer stuff now but like i think that we're in a world today that it's everything's so social. So it's like, if you were gonna, if you screw somebody else over, I just feel like you're gonna, it's gonna be known. We're, mm -hmm. Like, so I, my, my always thought process is like, I hope that that's enough for you not to do that to me. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if you did, it would be probably known. So, but I do understand there's all these like clauses, right? Like if this happens, then this happens. So I guess it's necessary. But it's, I always think to myself, if I were to set, just like you experienced, literally the same thing. If I, were to, if I were to send a client like a 12 page agreement, if somebody did that to me just by default, I kind of just turn my brain off. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> you know, and then, and then I got to get my lawyer involved. And then, you know, they go back and forth and it becomes like months of time. I'm like, was this even worth it? <laughs> like, <laughs> this, this, there's actually a chapter in the book <laughs> uh, called Deal of the Decade, where uh, I, yeah. I was not a, a transaction lawyer, I was a courtroom uh, person, but you, okay. in, in bankruptcy, you get involved in all kinds of deals, yeah, um, and tr um, distress deals, because there's not enough money to go around. That's how somebody, somebody's company got into bankruptcy. 
Yeah. And, and um, you know, you get the deal lawyers involved and they have this entire language of their own. And, yeah. um, and they yell a lot. No, not that bankruptcy lawyers <laughs> don't, but you know, it's 11 o'clock at night, somebody's making an unreasonable request and tempers are flaring. And uh, <laughs> uh, so, I, so I, I hear you. It, it's, um, yeah. it, it's part of the, the game. And, and I know from talking to lawyers, there are lawyers who, who will say, my client expects me to do that. That's what they, they, they think they're paying me for. They expect me to get in there and fight for every word. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I'm curious, you might not be able to share some of this stuff, but like, can you share like, what, what was one of the craziest cases that you like worked on? And maybe you can't provide names. I don't know. I don't know how that goes. Yeah. Um, so I don't really uh, do that in the book for, for that very reason. Um, okay. I don't, it's not a call out anybody book. I don't you know, take yeah. part, partners of mine to task or, or judges, God forbid, <laughs> or, or clients, <laughs> clients, which are not allowed to. Um, yeah. So I, I, I have, you know, those are called war stories, of course. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have, I have some, some uh, good war stories, but I tend to share them only with the other people that were working on the case. And I know that might be disappointing because I don't want no, to okay. stray. And even if I sanitize it and don't explain who the client is, somebody will recognize yeah, I get what, it. I, what it was about. And I like to respect that. I think that clients tr truly um, expect that. Um, For sure. Yeah. Was there a, I, I totally understand. I had to ask though. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, so yeah. what was the actual though? So you said you'd been feeling this for a while. Like, do like, can you go back to the day that you decided to like leave the law firm? Like, like what was that? Was there a breaking point or was it just like, you knew, like, it was just, it, 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 it was like, you knew, um, uh, the, the there's a, a famous, um, Supreme Court opinion about pornography, although I won't get into the porno part of it at all, because <laughs> that's not me either. Um, but it, in that, the Supreme Court was being called on to decide if something was pornographic. This was in the 1960s. And okay. um, they were being encouraged to define pornography. Mm -hmm. And um, Justice, um, uh, who was that? Which justice was it? Um, justice Potter. Uh, wrote famously that um, he wasn't going to define pornography, but what he was going to say is he knows it when he sees it. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and this was, or was not, I don't even remember which way it came down, but that, that became sort of the famous thing. And it, it, it applies, you know, to a career as well. There isn't uh, that moment, at least there wasn't for me, when the light bulb goes off um, and, uh, you know, oh, I must be a lawyer on the entry part, or the light bulb goes off and you must not be a lawyer anymore. It was more yeah. of a process, um, and you know, for me, the part of the the, the problem uh, was um, a series of what I might call midlife crises, um, where I wake up one day and I say, "Okay, I don't really want to be in the big law firm anymore." And that probably started in my late thirties, um, and it, it started me, you know, thinking or even dreaming up things that I, I could I might be able to do that would be something other than the law or other things I could do in the law profession besides, um, you know, at a big firm and, and trying cases. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it, that was a healthy thing to, to go through that. It, it's kind of what kids do. You know, they come up with these pipe dreams of things that they're going to do or people they're going to be. Um, and, you know, part of growing up is eliminating the, the things that aren't going to happen. Like, like for me, yeah, you know, I, I, my crazy um, kid dream was I was going to get bit by a radioactive spider and become the second Spider-Man swinging through, <laughs> you know, Manhattan skyscrapers, you know, as an eight-year-old thinking that. And I grew up in Queens and Peter Parker is from Queens. And I thought, well, that's the way to go. Um, yeah, exactly. but, uh, pretty, pretty, it would have been the way to go, frankly. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> yeah, kind of uh, eliminated that as, as a viable option. Um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and, you know, just a series of things that just, uh, didn't happen or didn't happen in, in a way that became a career change you know, so like sports photography nothing that I was ever able to do full-time but I ultimately was able to do it you know part-time um, mm -hmm. as a professional sports photographer in um, Kansas City wh where, where I was uh, at the time and um, you know that that was a good place to go when the practice of law was becoming a little overwhelming yeah as no, that makes sense the balance yeah. Um, and I'm curious with, with your wife, 
when you did decide, or wait, actually, before we get there, uh, for the exit, was it, was it a like clean exit out of, out yeah. of law or, or was it like a little rumble? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Um, uh, it, it was, it was, uh, organized and, um, <laughs> And it was, it was smooth and it may have been the smoothest thing that I'd ever done as a lawyer. And <laughs> certainly in the bankruptcy world, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. And, and um, in the, the exit world from the law firm, it, it, it went surprisingly uh, uh, smoothly. The, the, the only part that wasn't smooth was the very last thing that happens when you leave a firm is, you know, something to do with your, your, your phone in that, <laughs> Uh, you know, on our firm, we owned our phones, but we shared them with the firm. And so on the phone are contacts and client confidences and all of that. And the only way to fix that is to do a remote wipe. And, you know, you get a little memo that says, we're going to wipe your phone tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. And you think, oh my God, wait a minute. The other stuff on the phone is mine. <laughs> yeah. So if you wipe the phone, I'm screwed. <laughs> but <laughs> you can't do that. And so you, you go through this, you know, all night attempt to back up everything, which I should have, of course, been doing all along. And then the wiper at the firm, who was a nice guy, but um, kind of reminded me of a, of a gallows person from Blazing Saddles. <laughs> you know, he gets on the phone and he goes, we're going to commence the wipe. You look at your phone and everything that you've ever had on your phone is gone. And, and you know, in the modern era, that could cause you to break out in a big sweat bullets. Yeah. But, and it's only at that moment that you, you learn whether the backup worked or not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but other than that, you know, um, unexpected uh, incident, it, it, it went fine. I think people were surprised would be the main reaction that I had uh, yeah. to the point where um, um, about, you know, I don't know, a couple of months after I left the, the firm and the practice of law um, and moved on to the, the next round of things that I was going to do that I'd finally figured out was in my, in my passion. Um, I had lunch with one of my better friends at the firm who in all seriousness said, okay, now that you finished this wild hair, are you going to come back? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I'm not coming back. <laughs> this, I'm, this done. Was, I'm done. <laughs> it would take a very large event to, for me to come back, and I don't know what that event would be. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. No, I got you. And, and so then when you did step out, was it like, did you have like a bunch more free time, obviously? And like, what, what did your wife, what was that transition, I guess? Because I'm sure it was much different, I would imagine. Yeah. So what I learned about me and which helped me then to start to be better about figuring out how one leaves the practice of law is I, I, I really didn't want to retire. I don't even like that word. Um, me either. I'm with you. I'm uh, with you. I, I wanted to be as busy as I was as a lawyer for as long as I'm healthy. I just mm -hmm. don't, I didn't want to go to court anymore. I didn't want partners at a law firm anymore. I didn't want <laughs> clients anymore. You know, I didn't want judges uh, and opposing counsel and things, you know, all the things that make up the package <laughs> of law, with. I was done with. Uh, <laughs> but then that's a pretty big void to fill, a pretty big void. And um, when I started to focus more on how would I fill the void, and a lot of this is discussed in the book, um, uh, I, I became much more productive in deciding what, what would I do? What do I like? Well, I love art. I love music. I love photography. I love art. And, and um, you know, I grew up in an inner city. Um, and what, what can I do to make the lives of kids better in the inner city through art? Um, yeah. And um, there is no end of wonderful organizations that, that have that as their mission. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can find a good match in that, you can get very involved in that organization. And it's remarkable how many things in the world you can do when you don't go into the interview and say, how much do you pay? Um, yeah. Um, and, and the other passion I have um, is um, putting people into homes. I've done work for Habitat when we were in Kansas City before we moved to Denver. My home building days are probably in my rearview mirror. <laughs> but there's other ways to help Habitat and anything that yeah. I could do to help Habitat to put a family into a home, interestingly, achieves the same purpose. Um, so the studies show that kids that, uh, so if you want to, the, the Habitat talking points, which are absolutely true, you know, if you want to solve the drug problem, solve the housing problem. If you want to solve the education problem, solve the housing problem. If you want to mm -hmm. solve the gang problem, solve the housing problem. And, you know, you can't have 
five people living in a one bedroom apartment and have those four, four kids or three kids then expect that they're actually going to finish high school and get on to college. If you mm -hmm. put them in a home, the statistics are, are um, boggling that the, the rate of high school graduation might go from the 60s to the, to the 90s percentile rank and the number of kids that then go off to college is very high. And interestingly, yeah. it's the same thing with introducing young kids to art. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's almost a way to trick kids how to learn to read and how to, how to um, learn math as well. And <laughs> int introducing kids to art um, at an early age bumps up the graduation rate from high school and bumps up the entry into college rate dramatically. It's the same idea. And, and both of those are pretty hard to do in the, in the current environment, even before COVID. Yeah. COVID has not made this a, at all easy with kids not in school anymore. How do you deliver art to them? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. both of those, which I could talk about for hours, are things that I realize, okay, if I, I can, all these organizations will take as much time as you have to give them. Yeah. And so and I, yeah, uh, I'm, I not, agree, yeah. I'm not driving my wife crazy because I'm not home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, well, I, I, I love the retirement thing because that's, I feel like the whole retirement thing is broken in a sense. Like, because I, at least for me, and I, I work on many different things, I'm kind of a little sporadic with businesses and stuff like that. But I just, retirement, I feel like I'm not sure what I would do if I fully retired, it might not be good things, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know, <laughs> like I might get into trouble or something. <laughs> I need to stay focused. <laughs> but but I, I will say when I, when I did end the, my career, yeah. know, my secretary gave me a hug and everybody congratulated me. And of course they were all using the retire word and I, I wasn't, Yeah. Um, but I walked out, it was a snowy day in Denver. And um, if you know, Denver, there's 16th street mall is a pedestrian mall. Mm -hmm. that, our, that our office was on. And I, I, I left the building for the last time with my little box under my arm. I walk out into the snow and I, I, f I felt like the, the three guys that escaped from Alcatraz must have felt when they, if, if they made it to shore in San Francisco, you know, always yeah. looking over their shoulder for that marshal, the U.S. marshal that was tracking them. And I thought, well, there's got to be some partner that's going to be coming after me, <laughs> dra dragging me back into the law firm because th th this is the only life I've known. So it can't be this easy. But it, it turned out that um, with planning and with the sort of new mindset, and which took me 38 years to figure out how to gain that mindset, um, it, was, it was easy. And I, you know, I kind of felt like I was gliding a couple of feet off of the 16th Street Mall as I walked. Uh, yeah, walked like you're hovering, floating a little. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah. so there's, I was looking through the chapters of your book. There's a few that I want to ask you about that hurts sure. my curiosity. <laughs> so the first one is learning not to say fuck you. Tell us about that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm, I'm ordinarily not a particularly vulgar person. Um, and, and when I when I wrote that chapter, there was um, uh, a doctor that my my wife knew that was um, had had learned at a cocktail party that I was writing the book, and asked to see a sample chapter. And so I let him see the ones I had written already, and there was that one. And he asked to read that one. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and so I held my breath. It's a, it's a easy read. Um, and the title pretty much explains what the chapter is going to be about. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he came back and he says, I can't believe lawyers talk that way. Doctors don't. And I said, well, you've never been in a big law firm. <laughs> 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 you know, there's a great population in law firms that, you know, swear like sailors. And uh, um, wow, yeah, you wouldn't know that. Yeah, I, wouldn't, thought it was wouldn't more, know that. I, I feel like when I was younger, I, there was like a saying, like a lot like construction workers and like they, they, they swear a lot. Like one of my uncles is in uh, real estate and he builds homes and stuff. And he's like, you have no idea the things that my workers and I say like during, you know, when we're working. And I was like, yeah, I, I was like, I don't, but I, you wouldn't think lawyers would be, well, not with their clients around, maybe privately or with clients around. Yeah. Depends, on the client. Depends on the client. Yeah, <laughs> but def definitely privately. <laughs> But I mean, the actual theme of the chapter is, is that, you know, while they, they all, all lawyers say it and all lawyers think it, what you really, what their skill really is, is to absorb it and not say it, you know? So you're on the phone call at 11 o'clock at night with some opposing counsel that is just off the charts screaming at you and, um, and uh, 
very effectively. And what you want to say is the F-bomb <laughs> and then hang up. Um, but, you know, the, the better answer is, yeah, thank you for your thoughts and you hang up on them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I actually first came upon this as a very young associate down in Houston, which is where I started my, my, my legal career. Mm -hmm. And it was an oil and gas deal where um, the partner I was working for, who uh, I really loved, um, was uh, in this knockdown drag out negotiation with a, um, a company that was going under. That was why I was in the room. And mm -hmm. he and the other guy were going at it. And the other guy, uh, uh, who was a large guy smoking a cigar in the room, <laughs> um, said to my, my boss, um, you obviously don't know the first thing about securities law. And my boss, you know, could have drop the f-bomb but he was more texas elegant in his response which i will never forget was uh <laughs> that may be true um on the other hand i don't know anything about proctology but i know an asshole when i see one <laughs> 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 and that ended the meeting <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, which was a good time to end the meeting but it is a vulgar practice and there is um a lot of stress and there are moments when you know you uh you feel like saying something vulgar in response because that seems the appropriate thing to do. But you, you, the, the better play is to learn to how not to say it. Yeah, yeah make as, sense. As a lawyer. And certainly you wouldn't go to court and, and something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so I got, I got two more. And sure. I'm, I'm bringing up the ones that, it seemed, <laughs> that look like they're, they're problem related. <laughs> um, the second one is damage control. What's that? Yeah. One? So, um, the second venue where I practiced law after uh, Houston was uh, Philadelphia. My wife uh, did her, oh, cool. is, is a veterinarian and she got to do her residency at Penn. So off we went from Houston, which we loved, to Philadelphia, which I loved and she, she didn't. Um, but in, in Philadelphia, I joined uh, another large firm that was great, um, Deckard. And um, uh, there, there were things going on in the, the entire practice of law. It wasn't just Deckard, of course where um, uh, the, there was a recession uh, mm -hmm. in the late 80s. And that hit the corporate lawyer world pretty hard because it hit the corporate world pretty hard. And, and there had been uh, a lot of associates hired to, to beef up the staff to do lots of work that then wasn't there. And this is something that happens in the practice of law pr pretty regularly. And, and um, the, the good big firms try to figure out a way to hold on to everybody and repurpose them. Which, which the firm I was at certainly did. Um, but at some point, you know, the economics are that people have to be let go. And there were some firms in Philadelphia, not necessarily my firm, that were letting people go with this elaborate, you know, sort of uh, uh, scheme, I'll call it, <laughs> um, of uh, denying that they were letting people go because the local business papers were trying to get a hold of this and write a business story. And so they they would, uh, they would give interviews and make it worse and say, you know, um, no, we didn't really fire anybody. People were just sort of moving on. Um, there was one story of a, of, of a, of a firm that, that let you know, Bill, Bill go. Uh, and the next morning, Bill doesn't have a, there's no plate on Bill's former office that says Bill anymore. It's just blank. And somebody comes in and says, where's Bill? And they deny that Bill was ever there. <laughs> they never had a Bill. <laughs> and then they, they, just, was Bill. <laughs> yeah, they just didn't, handle it well they didn't really think through what happens when you're having to let go a lot of people um mm -hmm. and um uh you, know, you could argue corporations do it a little better because maybe they do it more often but damage control refers to the process in which management is desperately trying to come up with a story and a spin that will sell to the public who become interested and to all the associates that haven't been let go yet but are panicked that yeah. You know, at four o'clock today, they're going to be told this is your last day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that was the one thing, I, you know, there's that quote out there that's like uh, nine out of 10 businesses fail. And, it, it, and I remember when I first started my journey and starting my own business, like it kind of scares you a little, but I, I always felt, and thus far in my life, I feel just more comfortable having my own things rather than being at the will of like, because you don't know, right? Like the owner of a company a big company like that, like not all the employees know exactly right. the standing that the, like it could be bankrupt, but they're not telling everybody yet. <laughs> so I don't know. I just find it scary a little bit, but it, it, it is, it is scary. Um, yeah. 
you know, and lawyers, I guess, have the same choice that you made. Do I want to be in business for myself or do I want to be yeah. in a big firm? And some of that depends on your practice area and whether what you want to do can be sustained in a solo practice. Can you um, do both or is that not a, like if you or is it kind of frowned upon? Like you're not like no matter what, the client needs to come through the firm if you work for that firm. Yeah, correct. It, it's OK. A, it's a 100 percent allegiance model. Yeah. Okay. And, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. You, you wouldn't want somebody out doing work on the side and then trying to remember which client is their client, which client is the firm's client. True. That makes sense. Um, so my, the last one I wanted to, oh man, I'll let you either pain in the ass or bridge burning. Um, <laughs> Whichever one you want to share. You know, bridge burning is, um, is, is interesting because uh, uh, it, 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 a, a lot of the stories that I have in this, in the, the section of the book that discuss what it's like to be in a law firm, some of them are, are sort of parables, um, you know, Aesop's fable based on some things that happen to make a point. And, and the point there is, is that oftentimes, you know, the associates gather up in, in venues to talk about how difficult this, this job is, the, the one that they didn't know what they were getting into because law school doesn't prepare you. Uh, to be a lawyer, they they you know supposedly teach you how to think like a lawyer, and then that's the end of their job. And mm -hmm. law firms don't do a great job of of um, educating a law student as to what it's going to be like to be at a law firm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's a shock to the system. So there, there's a program that law firms have, the summer associate programs that all the big firms have, um, and but it really doesn't teach that law student what it's going to be like to live a law firm kind of life mm -hmm. um, and and it's probable in my um, in my uh, uh, thinking as as it's evolved that you know while it would be nice for law schools to do be more like med schools and let um, the lawyer know like the doctor knows what it's like to be in a hospital when they do their internship and their residency it would be nice if the law school could do that but they don't and they never have and probably mm -hmm. never will and it would be nice if the law firm could figure out a better way to give a realistic um, uh, picture to a law student as to what they're getting into here. It would have been nice if I got that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but they don't. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The, uh, there's a joke about that. But, and I'll come back to that because <laughs> it's a good joke. But the, um, the, the bridge burning sort of is, well, what happens when you gather up all these 20-somethings who have gone through law school, which is really difficult, and um, succeeded well to get into the big firm, and um, and you know things aren't going as they expected. And there's a lot of people in this group. They talk to each other, and um, when somebody leaves, oftentimes the others will come and say, you know, you've got to let the the, the management know how much this sucks, <laughs> because you know you need to you need to help on the exit interview the rest of us that, that are being left behind, and you know, the of course that leads to the, the 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 bridge burning notion in business. If you do an exit interview and you toast your former employer, it, it doesn't just end there. You know it, it gets out, and you'll never be able to go back to that law firm. And so that that chapter is actually two associates talking, one about to leave. And the other saying, you need to let everybody know for the, for the betterment of the rest of us who are being left behind in this, in this uh, prison. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they have this debate about whether that's the appropriate thing uh, to do or not. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Because, yeah, I mean, I'm sure like once you're whatever it is, six, seven years, I mean, you probably rack up a decent amount of debt. So it's like you're unless you got a scholarship or something. Um, so you're kind of like, whether you want to do it or not, you kind of got to do it. <laughs> because, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's probably six figures of debt. If I had to guess over the, the, the modern, uh, the modern uh, law student comes out on average with a bunch of debt, you know, back yeah. in 78, when I started law school, it was a different structure completely. Okay. Luckily for my wife and I, we had some debt, uh, my wife and me, but we had some debt, but n nothing like what the kids are forced yeah, to incur yeah. and you know if you uh there's different ways to manage that you know state schools will cost less than um an ivy league school if you're lucky enough to get into an ivy 
Um, but you know, if, if you're, if you're going to a top notch school, you could come out of debt, uh, out of law school with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. Yeah. Oh. And, and that's, that's yeah. a whole bunch of money to owe. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's the stuff that I think should be taught to kids too. Before, like that should be in high school before you choose college, because, um, like for for me, I don't. I came out eighty grand in debt when I dropped out two years in, mm-hmm. and like when I went into it, I was thinking to myself, oh well, I'll start out with like, you know, seventy grand a year salary. This is when I thought I was like still going to work for a corporation or something, and I was like, so in two years, that's one hundred forty k. I'm going to have, if I finished college, it'd be 160 K in debt. And so I was like, I think I'll be able to pay it off in like three, four years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You forget about taxes, living expenses. <laughs> I had no clue, man. It's, it, it's scary how little I knew about it. Um, so either way, it would just be nice if that they educated you. Like what does $80,000 of debt actually mean when you, when you add in interest and like all these other things, so. Yeah, and it's, it's hard to do due diligence, you know, when you're, when you're graduating from, when you're going to college and when you're graduating from college and you're looking for uh, additional education, all of those steps, it's real hard to, to get um, finite analysis, you know, finance yeah. kind of analysis. Okay, if I'm gonna spend $160,000 to go to college um, and that's how much I'm gonna owe when I come out plus interest, and then yeah. I have living expenses, you know, what, what would my personal budget look like? And how, would it be a decade or two decades or never? That yeah. it, it's not a few years. <laughs> yeah, it's not a few years. Right? Typically not, at least. <laughs> and, how, and how do I sustain myself? What's my life going to look like? Um, but we yeah. were lucky. We didn't, you know, this is something, the whole cost of education is something that's um, exploded, of course, in the last you know, 15 years or so. Mm-hmm. And, um I'm, I predate that by a lot. Yeah. I, I, went to a, I went to a great undergraduate school on a scholarship and then I, got, uh, uh, I went to a state school for law school. So I, I, I had debt, but nothing like kids are carrying. Yeah, not like that. Yeah. yeah. No, I got you. Um, so look, I wanna really, I wanna, the floor is yours. Like, I think, um, you know, I, I would think a lot of people listening are, are interested in reading the book now. So if you, like, if there's anything else you want to share, please do. And then like uh, website, uh, where to get the book and any, anything else, social media that you're on. Sure. So the book is, and just like that, it's, you know, available for purchase on all the usual Amazon, Barnes and Noble, iTunes, and in some uh, bricks and mortar stores, the bookstores, to the extent that they've reopened. Yeah. Um, It's very interesting to go live with a book during COVID, by the way. Yeah, it definitely changes the all game. Of, all of my dreams of how I was going to promote the book got flushed down the toilet. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's been very interesting to to try to get the book into bookstores when you can hardly find somebody at the bookstore to talk to. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but it's available in all those places. Uh, websites, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so you just search for me. And that's uh, LinkedIn and Facebook are my main social medias. Okay. Uh, search for Mark Shaken and my website is uh, markshakenauthor.com. Okay. And um, you know the book is the, the book is not a how-to book. It's it's a just the way I see it book. Um, yeah. But, um, it's been rewarding to see you know the reviews that it it does seem to have touched a, a chord with lawyers or or friends of lawyers or colleagues of lawyers uh, or people thinking of going to law school. It's, uh, it's been very interesting and some people find it funny and some people find it sad. So uh, I, yeah, well, I'm I think okay. I'm okay with either. <laughs> that's what I would do with the marketing then is find like, uh, groups that have a lot of lawyers in them, whatever those might be. Um, yeah. right. Cause I think that would be the way to start it. And then once it kind of hits the whole lawyer market, then you can get out. Cause it's kind of, it kind of seems more like a memoir in a sense. You know? It is. And in fact, yeah. that, that was one of the, you know, in Amazon, you get to pick two categories of key. Yeah. And that was one of the categories that I, I chose, although, you yeah. know, it's a memoir of somebody that's not particularly famous. So, um, there has well, to be no. yeah. yeah. Um, well, awesome, man. Thank you again for coming on the show. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, this is great. Um, best of luck. I enjoyed